our Accords Health Equity Seminar Series Part Two with a focus on social determinants of health. We're down to our last two seminars of the year. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of repeat participation, so we really hope this has been valuable. Uh, we are starting to plan next year's seminar series. So if there are particular topics, if you have a career development award, a K award, or something where you're needing some sort of education, please let us know. We're always willing to um, take into consideration what people are looking for in terms of education in those types of awards. Um, so um, you can request a planning or support consultation with the education program on our website. Um, so as I said, these are our last two seminars of the year. So uh, Dr. Nice will be talking about his project around community um, and social determinants of health. And then next week, um, Arthur McFarlane and his wonderful hairdo will be giving a follow-up presentation on his project related to community outreach and addressing social determinants of health in children. Um, and then both Arthur and John will, will have a little discussion uh, about what this experience is like of, of working with community. Um, so before we turn it over to Don, I just want to tell you a little bit about him. Uh, so Don is our, our local expert and go-to in community engagement. He's the director of our Accords Practice-Based Research and Community Engagement Group. He's the Green Edelman Chair for Practice-Based Research in the Department of Family Medicine. Um, he's the Vice Chair for Community in the Department of Family Medicine and the Director of Community Engagement and Research for the CCTSI. Um, you might have joined us for some of our community engagement fora that we've had throughout the year. Um, and this is a specific project that Don leads around social determinants of health and community. Um, we will have a little evaluation, I believe, right towards the end. We're trying to test out using polling rather than sending out um, uh, separate evaluations, trying to make to see if that functionality will work. So please do stick around to the end um, and answer our poll questions so that we can uh, try to get some evaluation numbers in, which are important for our continued funding. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Don to tell us about his project. All right, um, let's see, Jordan, if you can uh, enable screen sharing for me. And you should be able to share. I've got host disabled attendee screen sharing. You know, we'll get this one technical glitch out of the way early. Yeah, I'm still not Try one more time there. All righty. No. Huh. All right. I'll share for you and then you can just let me know when you want me to advance if that works for you. Okay, we can do that. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Jordan, for the technical help, and for to Bethany for that great introduction. Um, and uh, the only thing I will add to uh, what some folks don't know about me is that I also have a, a history as a as a technology guy. Um, so uh, before I came to Colorado, I was involved in Michigan with a technology startup and um, dabble a little bit on this side. One of the things I really like about this project is that it um, allows me to, to work, on the, work on the tech side and combine the engagement stuff. And um, it's one of the things I think is really cool about this, this work. So um, I appreciate your taking time out of your rainy Monday to, uh, to be with us. Um, I also want to thank some of my collaborators. So uh, Mike Martin is a 
professor in the business school at Northumbria University, which um, is in Newcastle in the UK. Uh, Bruno Sobral is um, up north of us, up at Colorado State. Dixon Dick um, runs a uh, small technology company in Longmont called Archithot and has been a great technology partner for us. And Kaylee Rivera from uh, our CCTSI community engagement um, team has uh, been really helpful in uh, facilitating this work over the past year or so since she joined our team. So Jordan, next slide. So um, you're gonna get a little bit of a vocabulary lesson today. Um, we're gonna talk about socio-technical design, infrastructure, conversations of care, middleware and human middleware. Um, and uh, there won't be a test at the end, I promise. Uh, but hopefully um, you'll find these terms to be useful and I'll be defining these as we go along. Um, so you can watch for that, that point in the presentation. Uh, next slide, Jordan. So as I think just about everybody knows these days, um, the, the real problem here is that medicine alone is not good enough or not, not properly positioned to really achieve health. And uh, this is my favorite diagram for describing that to folks. So this is a, this is a, a systems map that was um, constructed um, over 10 years ago by folks in the UK around the issue of obesity. And um, you can see some of the domains here that, that are included. So we've got social psychology at the top. You know, that's, that's, that's Bethany's area. Um, individual psychology, um, food production, food consumption, physiology. That's probably medicine's domain. Individual physical activity. Um, we know um, some of us are uh, try to have some influence over our patients and individual physical activity, but there's probably lots of other factors that figure into that and physical activity environment. So this is just kind of to, to give you a gestalt of, of where I'm coming from and thinking about um, health is that we can't do this alone. We got to have partners. Um, and uh, the real thing I want to address today is how can we best how can we best work with those partners? And describe for you guys um, how we're trying to do that in the community of Longmont. So next slide. So this has been talked about a lot. There's been articles in the medical press. The National Academy of Medicine came out with a report last year about integrating social and healthcare. And that's kind of the way folks are generally thinking about this. But I have to raise a cautionary note. And that is when, when in human history has integration between two cultures ever resulted in a harmonious union of equals? I can't think of any. Maybe, maybe somebody can type that into the chat window. And, but it's pretty pretty darn rare. Usually one culture ends up being dominated by the other one. And I think we're at risk with this work if we're taking an integration approach that our partners in the community will get sucked into the maw of healthcare and lose a lot of the value and what they bring by being closely connected in their communities. And I think we, we do that um, to our own peril. So that's, that's a pretty strong statement, but that's, that's where I'm coming from. The social care has a unique culture that's distinct from ours. Um, in medicine, you know, when I see a patient, I'm screening for things, whether that's depression, nowadays we're doing social determinant screening, you know, the notion is, well, let's detect problems and then let's either treat them or refer folks off. And that, that works great within the context of healthcare. Um, 
those roles and responsibilities are well known, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but imposing that kind of culture on social care is likely to have negative consequences. And the last, last quote on this slide is a quote that I got from uh, somebody who was a frontline person at one of our community-based organization partners in Longmont. And he said, you know, I don't want a system to help me refer people. I want a system that's going to help me communicate and make connections. Um, and that's, that's different than, than what um, we hear from vendors like Amp Bertha and Unite Us and, and some of the other folks that are, that are currently making technology plays in this space. Next slide. So um, many of you who've um, seen me or, or um, even Jack Westfall before me, you've seen this slide before. I like to use it when I'm talking to community groups about we're here from the university, we're here to help. That's often the mistake that we make, and I'm changing this for today. We're from healthcare, we're here to help. And you know, the notion is, this is Lyman, Colorado's um, fire, volunteer fire department, and they've got their equipment. They've got their hose, they've got all their gear on, all of that, but, and, and we're kind of like that when we show up in community or when we come, come from the healthcare side. We've got lots of, lots of money, we've got lots of tools, that sort of thing, but we oftentimes don't know where the fire is. And um, this is where we've got, to, we've got to take a step back and really listen. And I think this, this is a helpful concept for this work, especially. Next slide, Jordan. So Longmont, um, for those of you that don't know much about Longmont, and I certainly didn't before I started this work, um, Longmont is uh, just up to the, to the north and a little bit west of us, um, population of about 86,000 in the last census. Um, Longmont, <clears throat> one thing I found very interesting about Longmont is that um, they're, pretty, they're pretty into not just technology, but infrastructure. And so a um, few years back, they implemented a community-owned high-speed fiber optic network. So if you're a resident of Longmont, you don't have to sign up for CenturyLink or Comcast. You get community-provided high-speed fiber optic internet to your door, which I think is pretty cool. So they, they get infrastructure and they get technology. So that, that's important. Next slide. Jordan, next slide, please. It's showing up on my end as the Longmont map. There we go, there we go. Um, and you can go ahead and hit forward again just to get the build out here. Um, so Longmont, uh, this is Kind of a map of where it is. You can see it up there to the north, um, famous for Dale's Pale Ale and, um, and uh, Milk Stout from Left Hand Brewery, and there's a few other breweries in Longmont. Um, and uh, Jordan, if you could advance just to get the build out here. Thanks. So it's about 35 miles to the north of us. Oops, went too far. Um, interestingly, it straddles Boulder and Weld counties. Um, pretty low unemployment rate, um, median household income, um, as you see there, um, significant Hispanic population, but uh, again, a significant number of folks that are below the poverty line. So there are needs in Longmont, and when I first went up to Longmont to talk to folks. Um, I was invited up there and um, sat in the offices of the city manager along with um, the head of public safety and uh, some of their staffs. Um, you know, they said, we've got, we've got issues here. We've got significant homeless population. We've got folks that um, are aging in place um, who have issues. And we've got a pretty significant uh, population of youth that have um, 
mental health and substance use issues. So those were really kind of the three areas that they were, they were concerned about. Next slide. And uh, so their, their request and, and what they said was, we've got lots of great organizations here in the community and also within the city's infrastructure. Um, if you could help us help them communicate better, you know, we have, we struggle to get on the same page, particularly around individuals that are in need, but also collectively, um, just from a planning standpoint. And um, this second quote here is directly from uh, Harold Dominguez, the city manager. He basically, he said, help us with a system that provides real-time information such that Whenever someone is presented with a client or a patient, they have what they need to provide the best services. So pretty clear statement of, of goal there. Next slide. Okay, first, first vocabulary word here, term, socio-technical design. So this is, this is a term that was first introduced by um, folks at the Tavistock Institute in London. And it was an idea to um, counter this, this notion, uh, which has really been around since the Industrial Revolution of Taylorism. So Taylor was the guy that um, figured out that you could take um, basically iron fabrication and move it from a craft industry into an industrial process by breaking things down to individual elements, putting things on assembly lines, etc. And socio-technical was an idea that, okay, let's, let's push back against that because social needs are very, very important. And socio-technical design, as the second bullet says, is really tries to put the social needs above the technical wants. Um, and so, you know, the example that uh, is used here is that vehicles couldn't work on a road today without rules of the road. Now we know that sometimes people, people get around those, you know, that, that, but generally, generally people stay in their lanes, people use their signals. That is absolutely necessary and for the, that infrastructure and that, those technologies to work. For our work, as we were beginning this in Longmont, um, what this meant to us was we've got to get the community involved. They've got to be involved at all steps. And we were looking to build this infrastructure that could evolve through governance. So there would need to be <clears throat> both the local community being at the table, but we have to build something that they can shape. So it can't be rigid, it's gotta be something that can evolve over time. Next slide. And this is a slide that we used um, with our community partners to describe this. So socio convening the parties responsible for all the pieces of caring. Um, on the technical side, we build the data infrastructure that embodies that caring work. On the social side, socio side, define the roles, duties, and relationships together. And on the technical side, we'll use a reference architecture to put this together. So Jordan, if you'll advance this, there's a build out here. Um, so, you know, insert your organization here. The idea is to have shared local governance and again, to facilitate meaningful care conversations. Next slide. So what do we mean by infrastructure? Well, I think infrastructure is magic. I, if, if I had to spend the rest of my career just working on infrastructure, that's what I would do because infrastructures are flexible. Um, they can serve many different kinds of needs. They have the ability to evolve as needs change. So if you think about, you know, whether that's a, whether that's a building um, on our medical campus, whether it's a road, whether it's telecommunications infrastructure, those all have the ability to evolve as the needs of the people that are using them change. 
and rarely do they does it require that you rip everything out and replace it so that's another key feature about infrastructure so again examples if you think of telecommunications infrastructure um, roads uh, you know um, going back to when those were first invented I'm sure that uh, you know the Alexander Graham Bell would have never imagined what we're putting across telecommunications infrastructure at this point. Next slide. So again, just to give you a flavor of how we presented this to our community partners, this is a slide that we used with them. So, and we talked about applications versus infrastructure. So rather than focusing on a fancy new IT solution for one problem, which might be, we might say, okay, today we wanna to really focus on coordinating care. Um, we thought, let's, let's try to build a platform that will be able to solve most problems and evolve with that. So next build here. So again, using the metaphor of a road as infrastructure, Next build. If we build the road or the infrastructure properly, a lot of different applications could potentially travel on that road. Um, so just one way metaphorically to think about um, what we're trying to design and build. Next slide. All right, next vocabulary lesson, conversations of care. So the way that I think about this is in healthcare, we have a long history of established norms around how we interact with folks. What are the standard tasks and roles that need to be accomplished? So when I see a patient in my office over at AF Williams on the corner of MLK and Roslyn, um, I know when I walk into the room what the basic structure of that encounter is going to be and a pa the patients generally know that too it's been established over a long time when somebody gets admitted to the hospital there's norms around what gets done at a hospital admission what happens with the history and physical with an x-ray um, request with a hospital visit when somebody's rounding discharges referrals each person involved in those various tasks we know in healthcare, what the roles, the responsibilities, and the duties are of each of those individuals. And they're so ingrained, they're almost unconscious. You know, how can I help you today? Oh, doctor, I have a slight cough, blah, 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 blah. So um, when we move this over to the social care side, we've got a different set of roles, responsibilities, and duties, and they're not quite the same, but at their core, they also involve conversations, caring conversations between somebody who's seeking help and somebody that's there trying to provide help. So that's a really core concept for us is how can we create an infrastructure that's gonna facilitate and improve those conversations of care? Next slide. So here's how I think about this on the social, social side. So we got some build outs here, Jordan. So go ahead and hit this. So we've got an individual in need and he, let's say it's a housing need. So he presents to, to the housing office and next build and says, I need some help. I am, I'm, I'm homeless. And a conversation begins between those individuals. Tell me more. Now, the housing person at the housing office, they reach out to somebody they know and say, you know, I just talked to this person and it sounds like he's also got some food needs. Um, how would it be if I connected him to you? And then we get down to the last build out here. Um, there's also maybe some safety needs going on as well. So we bring a third party into this. How's this guy doing now? Well, I think it's, he's still having some problems. 
Um, and our safety person says, you know, let's, let's see if we can coordinate around this. So each one of these is a separate conversation. And um, because these folks have been in contact before, they sort of know their roles and responsibilities. But if you'd imagine that um, any one of these, uh, either in the second or the third conversation here, was with a new person, it'd be important to know, not just in a telephone book way of connecting, what the number is, but what kind of services does this person provide? How do they work? Those kinds of things so that when you pick up the phone, you know how to initiate the conversation. And in the same way, if I'm making a consult to a colleague in rheumatology, I have an idea of what they wanna hear from me. Next slide. So if we take conversations of care now to this concept of care coordination, we've got here in the middle of this slide somebody who's doing that job. And let's say over here to the right, there's a family that's presenting with needs. And we'll build this out here gradually. So that care coordinator makes contact, they have some discussions, they make some plans, they gather information, and they start reaching out to other service providers. Um, Gee, could you help this folk, these folks? Um, let's schedule a visit, that sort of thing. And a care plan develops. Now, each one of these arrows that you see here represents a separate conversation of care. So there are conversations between the care coordinator and the family, conversations between that person and service providers, conversations between the family and those individual specific service providers, and conversations that happen to create this care plan. And hopefully, if we have a way to monitor things, we've got confirmation that services got provided, services got delivered. And we have some way to have metrics and feedback about that. So ideally, an information service would help to inform this and facilitate that. All built around conversations of care. So how we think about this is taking, going back, we're gonna go back in time to the 1980s, before the internet, we'll talk about middleware. So middleware was something that was developed to basically help mainframe computers talk to one another. So we've got a mainframe over in finance, we've got a mainframe in, in um, the HR department, we've got a mainframe in the supply department. We need to make all those talk together. So middleware was developed as something that could span all of those and help them talk. And it's got several key features. And we think of this as a hub. So there's an index that registers all the identities, people, their roles, all the physical resources, documents. Um, there's a switch that moves things around, uh, make sure that information gets to the right place and on the right, in the right time. And then there's a portal that is responsible for reaching in to different information systems to take care of publishing information, syndicating, when people need to search for things, they can discover it, that sort of thing. And over on the left, in an individual user session, so like if I'm browsing Amazon's website, is the example I like to use. Behind the scenes, that website is there's a there's a piece of middleware that's pulling stuff in from various parts of Amazon. So every time you sign in, you see something slightly different that's tailored to you because oh, Don likes to shop for blah 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 blah. And last time he ordered from us, he ordered one of these. Maybe he wants one of these next. Well, that's middleware magic working behind the scenes. So when we think about helping to facilitate the work of conversations of care, we think about it as a middleware function. And 
again, this is this is an infrastructure. It's an architecture, not communications architecture, not a relational database architecture. So again, we're trying to equip these frontline cares with better communication tools that will result in better coordination, rather than a data capture and storage platform and that can't evolve very easily. And this last bullet is an important one. So um, sometimes when I've presented our ideas to um, folks who kind of work in the standard information technology fields, they, they're like, well, what are you gonna store? What, are you, what kind of analytics are you gonna use? And I, what I try to explain to them is that the information, the valuable information here is the traffic, is the messaging traffic. Oh, what's happening with during COVID? What kinds of services are people needing? What kind of traffic's moving across the system? That's where um, some of the magic is, and, and that's what will be used to govern and evolve the system. Next slide. So we've all evolved, too, to thinking of people that are frontline workers doing that care coordination job. They're actually human middleware. They know how to make connections. And so if we can make that human middleware work better and more effectively with our technical middleware, that'll be a win. So we started this back in two, December of 2017. Um, and you can kind of see here what we've done uh, so far. We started listening to feedback, introducing the project to folks in Longmont, and we started to map stories and pathways. You know, what are your conversations of care like? Um, where are the roadblocks? Um, we've had conversations about data gaps that get in the way, um, and what are some ways that we might solve those? Um, and how might an infrastructure design help? Um, Last summer, we were um, putting in a large proposal to the National Science Foundation. We got a lot of feedback on that. Um, back in November, um, we asked what, what kinds of signals are gonna be important for, for each, each of your organizations? When do you wanna know when somebody that you're providing services to maybe is getting into trouble or maybe they're, maybe they're actually doing things like keeping their appointments, that sort of thing. Um, and then most recently in February, we reviewed some of our technical specifications because in October, the city council in Longmont voted to fund us um, with some startup funding and we were getting ready to launch that and then COVID hit. <laughs> so we're, we're temporarily paused, um, but we're actually, um, still moving forward, and I can talk about that a little bit in the discussion. So here's an example of how we're map how we've been mapping the organizations in the community. This is a clever web application called Kumu, um, which you can access for free, um, and we've now mapped over ninety. Um, 90 distinct community-based organizations that are serving the population within Longmont. Um, and the lines here represent connection, existing connections between those organizations. Um, we've done small group exercises where we've asked, so imagine in this infrastructure that we're gonna to design together, what do each of your organizations know about your clients that you think might be useful to share? What does your organization not collect that you might need to know? What does that individual client need to know? Fourth bullet here, what do you not want to know? What's going to be like a third rail for your organization? No, 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 don't tell us that because that gets us into legal stuff or whatever. Um, and when, how timely, what's the timeliness aspect? Um, so we've done 
multiple of these exercises that have been very valuable um, with our groups in, in Longmont. Next slide. And from that, we've developed surveys. So we've gone back and surveyed them to say, okay, um, what of these elements on the left, social data, are you currently collecting versus on the right, what do you need? So yeah, everybody gets personal contact information, basic demographics, blah, 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 blah. Um, gee, we could really use information about food security, eligibility, who are the other social care providers in our community? We never have a meeting with this group where people don't start having conversations. Oh, I never, never knew your organization did that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is, you know, this is Longmont. It's this relatively small community, um, but that, that happens all the time. Next slide. So through all this, we've developed a story that we like to tell. Um, and this is a story about Amy. Amy is um, a delightful elderly woman who's um, living at home, uh, independent still. And uh, next slide, we'll tell you about something that happens to Amy. So um, Amy falls and she calls 911 and um, who comes but the fire department? Fire departments do lift assists all the time. So the fire department comes out, they make a determination, oh, maybe we should have EMS come out, check her out. The EMS folks come, she's fine, and they file a report. And that report goes somewhere. <laughs> but it stops there. This is the current scenario, okay? Hit the next bill, Jordan. So let's say she falls again. Fire department, EMS comes out. Oh my gosh, she better go to the hospital because she's broken her hip, right? She gets her hip fixed. She gets some meds for her UTI and she's back home. Well, could have we intervened in this situation somehow? Um, what if, what if? So next build out, yeah, reports go, reports go somewhere. So what if we could intervene in this situation and when this person falls, actually a notification goes to our hub. Um, and because we're looped into Carrillo, we could have healthcare involved. Hey, Amy's fallen. You need to know this. And we might be able to intervene earlier. And the hub could message family members, could message primary care provider, could message other folks in the social care world. Um, so this is a little bit of our vision for how this could help prevent um, needless outcomes. And we put a web-based front end on this um, and we've been listening to folks to make sure that um, we design this such that they don't have to learn a new system. Next slide. So one of our uh, community meetings last summer where we met with the Longmont Neighborhood Group Leaders Association, somebody stood up and said, you know, it sounds like you're building something that to do what we used to be able to do for ourselves when this community was smaller. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're trying to build an infrastructure, make that possible again. And we're using we're using our fancy tools. We've got engagement stuff. We're doing some ethnography. We've got technology. Um, we're trying to do this in a socio-technical way um, with community governance. Um, but most importantly is we're listening. We're listening. So I'm going to stop there. And I'm really interested to hear your questions and, and feedback. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, every time I hear about that project, it's gotten you know a little bit more legs underneath it. It's really interesting to see how it evolves. Uh, so I want to open it up to to questions. We have a, a fairly small group, so I think we can invite people to turn video and audio on and ask their questions out loud rather than in the chat. Great.
or you can put it in the chat if you're more comfortable. Don, why don't I, this is Arthur, why don't I kick off uh, some things. Thanks. I think the interesting thing that I find with uh, what you've done is you've taken the time to go through and try to understand what it is that folks need. And it's been that discussion back and forward that then has allowed you to say, okay, we're gonna put some more things in place that are more technical. But what was really interesting is when you got to the end and the gentleman said, well, you're really just trying to recreate what we were able to do for ourselves before. So there is some memory in the society, in the culture, in the community of a time when people got together and they talked and they helped one another. And it seems like there's a hunger to get back to that in, in Longmont particularly and get back to a point where they are self-sufficient. How does, how, how, how does what you're doing lend itself to that self-sufficiency and a question that you can't answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How long do you think you're going to t it's going to take for us to get there? Yeah, yeah. Those are great, great, great comments and, and questions, Arthur. I think, um, you know, the, uh, the way that I think about this is um, one, of the, one of the metaphors that I, I use sometimes is, um, you know, the, the infrastructure of um, rural electric co-ops and, you know, how um, that that built infrastructure that, you know, I, I know a little bit about those because my father-in-law sat on the board of um, his rural electric co-op for a long time. And, you know, those infrastructures are locally governed. They, you know, they figure out what the needs are, you know, where they need to put a line. And that is really, I think, you know, that that's the, that's the secret sauce to getting them to the point where, we can hand this over to them and they'll, they'll run with it. Um, so that's, that's really important, uh, I think. And, and you're absolutely right. Taking the time is uh, really important. One of the things that we've thought of, because we, we're interested in doing this in other places too, is you know, how can we develop, because um, ideally what we'd like to do is have a community decide we want to do this for ourselves and how can we provide them the technical assistance so they're actually they're actually doing the convening they're doing the work and when they're ready here's the technology it's open source here's how you implement it we'll help you configure it according to your community's needs and we'll go to the next community right uh, Georgina, uh, you have your hand raised. Yes. Hi, um, Georgina. Hi, Don. Um, are there privacy issues? I was thinking of the last, the, the example you gave, I think her name was Amy. You yeah. kind of were showing what would happen now and then what would happen with this uh, system in place. And so I was wondering, were there any privacy concerns uh, as you worked this through? Yeah, I'd like to say no, but we know better than that. <laughs> of course, of course, there's privacy concerns. And, and I, we've, you know, oh, fortunately, we've, through this process too, we've, we've developed some ideas about how to address those. Um, you know, this is a, the, on the social care side, um, you know, HIPAA is not necessarily in play, but I, I feel perhaps even more of an obligation because of that, that we have to be extra careful about privacy. And so um, one of the examples that we used at our, at our last convening to explain how we're thinking about this is, so um, let's, let's say that uh, somebody, you're, you're a young person and you're going to uh, a bar or restaurant and you want to buy a beer, you know, they ask to see your driver's license. Why do they ask to see your driver's license? Because they want to know that you're old enough to drink, right? Well, 
you're also presenting them with a lot of other information on that driver's license, your address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we want to try to do when those, when those, we want to try and filter those attributes such that somebody has at a client level, the individual has the ability to say, yes, I'm willing to share that I'm of age to drink, but I'm not going to tell you my address. Um, so that's, that's an example. And what we will be working with um, organizations and community members is to define those and define the, the, basically the switches in the system that will allow folks to have control over that. The other example I use is when I was at Michigan, there was a, a big push by the chair of psychiatry to um, share information from psychiatry to primary care colleagues about what was going on. And psychiatry faculty were freaking out, you know, we can't do that. And um, we, had, we had conversations. I was like, look folks, I don't need to see your therapy notes. I want to know the diagnosis and I want to know if you prescribed any meds. Oh, that's all you need. Yeah. Ken. Bethany's on mute. <laughs> I was just um, saying I was going to lower Georgina's hand, but go ahead, Ken. <laughs> um, so one of the, I'm sort of following off of what Arthur said, and um, I, I think, Don, you probably heard me talk about this before, but one of the things that you did is so, that's so crucial to being potentially successful is hearing what the community's needs are, not coming in and telling them what they need. And so um, the example I give is my wife used to work for the state health department and in HIV sexually transmitted infections and went into Montbello Green Valley Ranch and they told them what they needed and nobody was interested in doing anything. And so then at a later time, my wife um, was for a, a leadership fellowship project, went into the community and found all of the community leaders, whether it be the school principal or the bank owner or the business owners, um, interested students, and got the people together and convened what it, what is it that they needed and what is it that they perceived that were their most important problems. It created a group that um, then led to them having a health fair and they continued to do that. And she actually stepped away and it persisted without her, which is I think the, the key of these things being successful, as opposed to the slide that you showed about the fire and the university pointing the hose in the wrong direction. And then your slide, which was interesting, was the one of your perceived needs and then their perceived needs. and and yours was trying to get the data and stuff for your purposes and theirs was trying to get food so that they don't starve for their purposes and so i would say that the community's needs are often more difficult to um, solve than the, what you might have perceived as your needs to get your project done and so um, but if you get the community engaged in a way to solve their own problems to identify them and then say okay well, this is our problem what are we going to do to address it as opposed to you telling them what to do you're giving them tools yeah. to help them to do it then i think that it'll be more sustainable and um and successful right yeah yeah thanks ken yeah i can't uh, you know i of course was at the health department at the same time working on some of those same things and we saw many communities who we wanted to talk about one thing, uh, STDs or HIV or uh, infectious diseases of other kinds. And the community simply said, We're, we have other priorities, right? <laughs> we have things that are more important to us to have a conversation about. And it took us as a department a while to learn that we could actually spend our money, spend our time, spend our resources 
in a way that was helpful to the community at large, as opposed to just us as a department. And once we got there, I think we were more successful at, at helping communities to deal with some of the different things that they wanted to deal with, which in my mind, and this is, this is my opinion, and Don, please chime in, I think that's what's led us to the current place that we're at with social determinants. I think we have gotten here simply because we, as, as bureaucratic organizations said, okay, we're not really getting where we wanna get, let's give the power over to the community to, to lead us instead of yeah. us trying to come in and dictate. And that's where we are with social determinants. I think that social determinants of health is a new, quote unquote, new term in some ways, but it's the same thing that we had to learn back 20 years ago, 30 years right. ago. Right, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, you know, that there's, there's, I mean, it's really kind of, what are the, what are the assets in the community? versus what are the deficits and how can those be how can those be harnessed with you know whatever tools we've got in our toolkit you know um, but you guys be the ones to apply them so where do we go next Don I think uh, where does social determinants of health take us we you know i think kent's question is and and comment is a good one in terms of here's the historical place we were uh you've done a great job of describing where we are in your mind where does where does some of this go next yeah i think that um you know i i'm hopeful i i, I have hope just because these conversations are happening um and uh, I think that um, it's, you know, like any kind of culture change, um, it's gonna take time. Um, I think there's gonna be, you know, folks that are gonna stub their toes a lot. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, I think, and, and you know, COVID is, is bringing this stuff right to the forefront in terms of, uh, you know, I've been in conversations with, with folks that, you know, from the university hospital that are like, oh my gosh, you know, that now that now it's suddenly hitting them in the face, what, what they need to be paying attention to, where some of the gaps are, and um, hopefully, you know, those, that's going to lead to some changes in how resources are allocated, how things are done. Um, because a community is only as strong as its most vulnerable members. I couldn't agree more. I think that's the, the real key for us is to see if we can learn some lessons from the COVID-19 situation that we're in right now about where the gaps are what some of the problems are, some of the resource reallocation issues, as well as just listening some more. Um, I think, um, again, back to Kent's point, we didn't listen very well in those days. We learned and we've, we've evolved. I think this is the next evolutionary step for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Well, I'm looking forward to your presentation, Arthur. Thanks. Um, I'll take a, a, a different approach to some of the same kinds of questions and issues. Um, we've got a school-based health program that we've been running uh, in Denver Public Schools for about 12 years. And then and in the last few years, we've branched out to some other communities. So I'll talk a little bit about how social determinants has been a part of the conversations that we're having with parents of students and with school nurses and, and a different kind of infrastructure, uh, but same issues ultimately yeah. uh, as you're talking about and, and really just kind of coming at it from a slightly different angle. That'll be great. Yeah, looking forward to it. Well, thank you everybody for coming and in, um, in, uh, 
doing our little evaluation. I think that worked fairly well. Um, and thank you so much, Don, and we look forward to uh, seeing you next week, Arthur. Great. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Thanks Don. Take care, everyone. See ya.